Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away. Tonight, the closure of an Alberta plant highlights pandemic worker safety. Our members in that plant are grieving and they're horrified and they're terrified. How Alberta's government responded. With new vaccine doses on the way, truckers say they deserve priority. We haven't even been told if, if we're gonna get vaccinated or not. As Ontario opens up early warnings about the next lockdown. If the goal is to protect the health and safety of Ontarians, I think this is a bad decision. And a secretly recorded cry for help makes international waves. Every day I am worried about my safety and my life. A princess alleges forced attention by her father. This is The Nation. From day one of this pandemic, the priority for governments across the country was crystal clear to keep Canadians safe. So new rules and policies were put in place on everything from when you can get a haircut to when you can get a vaccine. And yet tonight, there are questions about just how well those policies are protecting some essential workers. Like people keeping us fed and those hauling goods across the border. In two stories, we will look at two industries, the pandemic dangers and the calls for action from workers themselves. So let's begin in Red Deer, Alberta, where a meat processing plant has temporarily closed amidst a deadly outbreak of COVID-19. 343 cases are now linked to it. And as Aaron Collins tells us, workers are worried. Outside the Olamel plant in Red Deer, a sign boasts the facility and its 1,800 workers help feed the world. But a spike in COVID-19 cases here has changed that. The company announced late Monday it was temporarily shuttering the pork processing facility. More than 300 workers there have now tested positive for COVID-19. One man in his 30s has died, a death that has shaken his co-workers. Some of them are scared to work because, you know, they worry about their health, they worry about their family, and stuff like that. This employee, whose identity we've agreed to protect, worked in the same area as the man who died last month. As a close contact, they were told by the company to get tested for COVID-19, but they say they weren't told to isolate at home. If we're going to get tested and we haven't received the results yet, are we still coming to work while waiting for the, for the result? And she said yes because you guys need money. While waiting for those results, they worked a second job at a group home for people with disabilities, raising concerns of spread outside the plant, a common worry for lower income workers during this pandemic. People who are moving to multiple employers are only doing so because they can't afford to put food on the table without doing that. There are now outbreaks at eight meat processing plants in Alberta, and the union that represents workers at Olamel says the province should have closed the plant sooner. We have a deep concern about a third wave, and we need to protect workers in workplaces. Our members in that plant are grieving, and they're, and they're horrified and they're terrified. All this as cases of COVID variants continue to rise in Alberta. I know that many Albertans are concerned about these variants, and I am too. I am particularly concerned about the growing number of cases not linked to travel. The province says it inspected the Olamel plant 14 times since mid-November, but even as cases of COVID-19 surged in the new year, it was allowed to stay open. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. And what about Canada's commercial truckers, so vital to the economy? Some are now speaking out about dangers they see and protections they want to see. Here's Diane Buckner. Leanne and Gerald Steves have just arrived back in Ontario after their weekly trip to California. The husband and wife trucker team say Americans they encounter don't take COVID seriously. They don't wear their masks, or no, they're not social distancing. They're, they travel everywhere. Calgary-based trucker Louis Franco also feels unsafe. People uh, look at you if you're wearing a mask like you're, you're weird, like, you know, you're overreacting. Of the 10 million entries into Canada since the pandemic began, the Canada Border Services Agency says close to 5 million were commercial truck drivers. Proof of a negative COVID test? Not needed. Essential workers such as truckers and emergency service providers, as well as cross-border communities, will be exempt from this requirement. The original coronavirus is already hard enough. These new variants are even more transmissible and potentially more deadly. 
This epidemiologist is puzzled why essential workers aren't given rapid tests. Why they're not being deployed at the borders, I don't, I don't know. The Minister of Public Safety says that is now being considered. We're looking at uh, a, a implementing a system of regular testing um, to, to help protect those essential workers and truck drivers. Like again, Leanne and Gerald Steve say border tests would lead to massive lineups. The Teamsters Canada Union agrees. People will be sitting there for two or three hours, you know, just in that. Now, trucks and trailers are 75 feet long, you know, they, where are you going to put them? The government. Louis Franco says vaccine priority would be a better way to go. We haven't even been told if, if we're going to get vaccinated or not. There is nothing, no information, nothing. Truckers are being told to wear masks and watch for symptoms. But until new protocols are in place, thousands will keep traveling to a potentially riskier nation regularly. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Woodbridge, Ontario. The impact of policy choices can also be seen at airports. COVID restrictions have been tightened for international air travelers, but not flight crews. They are effectively free to move around at will. Briar Stewart has that angle. After this Air France crew checks into their Vancouver hotel, they're free to grab a meal at a restaurant, even hit up a ski resort if there's time. They don't face restrictions because they're deemed essential workers. The federal government says crews should limit contact with local workers, crowded areas and public transit, but there's no requirement to isolate. It is a big concern. Actually, there's more flights than we, we think, we realize. There are a lot of flights coming in and out of Canada still, and there's still hundreds of passengers testing positive. This public health professor says given the concern over COVID variants, she believes there should be more restrictions. So you think about if they did come in from a country where, you know, there's high exposure, or anywhere really, they, they may be putting um, Canadians at risk. She believes Canada should follow countries like Australia and Taiwan, where flight crews returning home have to isolate and foreign flight crews have to stay in their hotel rooms. For areas like Hong Kong, you're actually quarantined in your room. So if you have a layover of 24 hours, 48 hours, you're in your room that entire time. You're actually not permitted to leave. You have to do testing prior to departure to make sure that you're you know, COVID free. The federal government has hinted that it could institute more testing for essential workers, but it's not clear if it would extend to foreign and domestic flight crews. And so far, there's been no talk about making them isolate. They are, as essential workers, um, allowed to come into the country, but our expectation is people will conduct themselves responsibly and not engage in behaviours that put others at risk. Non-essential travellers coming to Canada have to quarantine even if they've had the vaccine. That's because the government acknowledges that foreign travel is a risk. The question is why then is the government not applying that to flight crews from outside the country? Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, Canada as a whole has come a long way in the past several weeks. In terms of daily new cases, we are back from the brink. The question is, for how long? Today, across the country, a total of 2,388 new cases. That's the kind of number we used to see last fall. Compared to a peak, just over a month ago, case rates are down more than 60%. But restrictions are now relaxing across the country, and the fear is this trend might lose steam and just turn back upwards. Ontario's province-wide lockdown ends today. Most kids back in classrooms, a color-coded regional approach back in place. But with variants being a growing threat, Ellen Morrow looks into whether the province has a plan to keep the virus from roaring back. At this Hamilton hair salon, happiness tempered by trepidation. The province walking a fine line with reopening. I'm happy to be open. But I'm also nervous because there is definitely a possibility we could close again because the cases are going to go up. In most of Ontario, salons, gyms, restaurants opening at limited capacity. All this easing up happening as more contagious variants are on the rise. 7% of all positive tests in Ontario are now variant cases. And while the overall case count is going down, Ontario is still dealing with rampant community transmission and about 1,000 new cases a day. We're opening the economy as we're having kids go back to school as these variants become more and more dominant. We're changing too many things at once, but if the goal is to protect the health and safety of Ontarians, I think this is a bad decision. 
The province concedes cases could very well spiral again. It's ramping up asymptomatic surveillance testing at schools and sending more rapid testing kits to essential workplaces. Following criticism, it was slow to deploy them. Still, the province is not being aggressive enough, says this epidemiologist. We got it faster if we just take our time and not let too much transmission happen in the short term so that we can let the vaccines do their job. Experts, including one of the province's top medical officials, say paid sick leave is crucial. But Premier Doug Ford scoffed today at reinstating the provincial program. People need to know that if they're not feeling well, or they need to go get a test, they're not going to lose their pay. Restaurant owners Jennifer and George Varagos were forced to lay off staff in the first lockdown. They are now hoping for the best, fending off fears of the worst. If a third lockdown comes in, I, I don't see us, I don't see it making it at all. I mean, we're barely making it now. It's so hard for people. Ellen, the heaviest restrictions, it seems, are still in place for the hardest hit parts of the province including the Toronto area. Any sign of when those restrictions start to lift? Well, those won't be lifted or eased for another week at the earliest, Adrian, in places like Toronto and Peel that remain in lockdown with the exception of the schools. That would take us to February 22nd, again, at the absolute earliest. The fear of public health officials, though, is that this may just simply be too much too soon, especially with those variants, and that before too long, the province could find itself back exactly where it started. Again. All right. Ellen Morrow in Toronto tonight. Thanks, Ellen. You're welcome. Quebec is also relaxing some of its restrictions just in time for March break. We have to limit the number of openings and we choose the one that is helping families. So that means starting February 26th, movie theaters, indoor pools and sports facilities will reopen in red zones. Outside gatherings of up to eight people will also be allowed. The Premier says the rest of the restrictions, including that overnight curfew, will stay in place in most regions. Roll out and then ramp up. That was always supposed to be the plan for vaccinations in Canada. But the ramp up part never happened. The country spent weeks with a trickle of vaccine deliveries. All that set to change now. Since December, Canada has received and distributed an average of about 100,000 doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine a week. For this week, Ottawa plans to quadruple that, then keep up or exceed that pace until 4 million doses have been delivered by the end of March. Canada is supposed to have received a total of 2 million doses of the Moderna vaccine by the same date. So is the ramp up finally coming? Hannah Thibodeau reminds us vaccines on tarmax? Well, that's just step one. This week, we are on schedule to receive our singest largest, single largest Pfizer vaccine shipment to date. After weeks of frustrating delays, optimistic words from the Prime Minister. But already another unexpected glitch. Snowstorms across the U.S. held up deliveries by a day. When they're back on schedule, here's how the vaccines will be distributed this week. B.C. and the Prairies will get just under 130,000 doses. Atlantic Canada, almost 26,000. Quebec, more than 91,000, and Ontario, nearly 157,000 vaccines. This Liberal government is failing. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh wants the government to fund federal vaccination sites across the country and involve the military. The government says if the provinces need extra help, they'll get the support, but... It properly is a provincial uh, jurisdiction to determine uh, the populations that they'll uh, vaccinate in, in which sequence. Using guidance from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, each province has prioritized who gets the vaccine first. And that leads to the biggest question for Canadians. How will people know when it's their turn? I'd love to be able to look you in the eye and tell you with a straight face right now exactly how, for example, an 80-year-old in the community can get access to vaccination, but that it hasn't yet uh, been operationalized. Other provinces are already preparing to expand vaccinations to people 80 and above. Booking opened up this morning for the prototype immunization clinic. Those receiving an invitation to book an appointment are being selected randomly by their postal code, and these are the postal codes which are within an hour distance of the clinic site. 
Most provinces are planning on using call centers and online reservations to book vaccination appointments. But now that the vaccines are coming, the trick will be execution, and there's no time to waste. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Supply shortages are also forcing back vaccination targets in the U.S. Anthony Fauci now anticipates most won't have access to a shot until late May or maybe early June. So far, more than 39 million people there have received the first dose. 15 million have received both. So this comes as the number of new cases trends downwards in the U.S. to levels not seen since November. But as Katie Simpson shows us, there's little celebration. The streets of New Orleans have never been so quiet. Mardi Gras, in its traditional form, is a no-go because of COVID. But there is new hope that perhaps the party may return next year. I think we're starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. But at the be at best, we're just, it's a start. COVID numbers in the U.S. are trending in a better direction, with steep drops in cases and hospitalizations. The U.S. is now averaging 86,000 new infections a day, a plunge from over a month ago when daily cases averaged 249,000, a record high. I think some of it is coming off of the highs from the holidays. Uh, second is I think there's some evidence that people are being a bit more assiduous about mask wearing and social distancing. Experts say it will still be a few weeks before vaccines noticeably slow the spread of the disease. More than 55 million doses have been administered so far, with the U.S. now averaging 1.7 million shots in arms per day. Yes, yes, we are very happy, very happy. Even with the bigger picture looking brighter, public health leaders say this is not the time to be complacent. We've just got to be careful about getting too excited about that because we do have the challenge of variants. The more contagious variant, as first seen in the UK, is expected to be the dominant strain in the US by March. This is kind of the last big storm before vaccines really pull us out of this pandemic. And that's why there's such a rush to get all the elderly and high risk people vaccinated as quickly as possible. The White House is focusing on getting more help to the front lines. The president is hitting the road to try to build public support for his new COVID relief package and to pressure Republicans into backing it in the hopes of getting it passed as quickly as possible. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. There are now more than three dozen human rights complaints against police forces in Ontario alleging sexual harassment and misconduct. A new Fifth Estate investigation takes a closer look at one of them, the Ottawa Police Service, and allegations of sexism that has entangled one of the city's top cops. Here's Judy Tree. Jennifer Vanderzander is a mother, a wife, and a civilian employee of the Ottawa Police Service. She says Deputy Chief Uday Jaswal sexually harassed her repeatedly. He told me that he wanted to date me. I clearly communicated to him that I wasn't interested in him that way. Um, and it didn't stop. After telling her partner, Peter, a sergeant on the force, he asked Jaswal to stop. I'm now telling you in the presence of my supervisor and my supervisor's supervisor, another inspector, the sexual harassment of my wife needs to stop. Jennifer filed an Ontario human rights complaint alleging the deputy chief touched her inappropriately at work. It's so brazen. It's so his, I, I don't know, like sense of entitlement to just do what he wants. But the Vanderzanders soon realized that taking on power comes with a price. Their actions may have put a target on Peter. After his wife filed her claim, Peter was hit with four disciplinary complaints in one day. If you come forward with sexual harassment allegations against senior members of the auto police, there are going to be consequences. Guard yourself accordingly. Deputy Chief Jaswal declined requests for an interview. In his statement of defense, he characterizes his interactions with Jennifer as misunderstandings and admits to awkwardly touching her by accident. But since then, two other female officers have made allegations of sexual harassment against Jaswal. He's now suspended and facing six counts of misconduct. The allegations will be heard in April. I think this is a Me Too moment for the Ottawa Police. Um, you know, the fact that someone can rise to that level in the Ottawa Police Service gives you a sense of how deeply rooted uh, those kinds of norms are uh, in, in the organization. 
The problem of sexism goes beyond the deputy chief. Including Jaswal, there are now eight officers accused of misconduct involving women. The allegations include harassment, uttering threats, and even rape. All the officers have been suspended with pay, and they intend on fighting the charges. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. For the whole story, watch Exposed Sexism in Ottawa Police on the Fifth Estate. That's Thursday night starting at 9 p.m., 9.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television and CBC Gem. The federal government announced long-awaited gun control legislation today, laying out its plan for dealing with assault weapons and handguns. That includes a new gun buyback program. But as Salima Shibji explains, this plan left those on both sides of the issue unhappy. Firearms. This motion is deemed adopted. It's a bill long promised on the campaign trail and nearly a year ago after a gunman killed 22 people and scarred Nova Scotia. In the wake of that mass shooting, the Liberals restricted 1,500 models of assault-style weapons. Today, confirmation of a buyback program for owners of those guns, but few details on how much Ottawa will pay, only that the option will be voluntary. The measures we're proposing are concrete and practical. The Liberals Anyone leaning into the fact that those who choose to keep their guns will have to follow strict rules. Can't take them to a range. Can't even drive around with them. They've got to be locked up in a safe. And then we have rendered it virtually useless as a firearm to the law. And, and as a consequence, we believe the vast majority of rational firearm owners will choose to surrender them. A belief not everybody shares, with the Bloc Québécois scoffing at the government not forcing owners to turn in their guns. Which makes the law, under many regards, useless. And the Conservatives insisting the legislation completely misses the point. Mr. Trudeau misleads people when he tries to suggest that, that buying things back from hunters and, and other Canadians who are law-abiding is somehow going to solve the problem of of shooting and criminal gang activity in the, in the big cities. The Liberals, in trying to please gun owners and gun control activists, have ended up displeasing both. It's a bad situation for a lot of people who haven't done anything to do to deserve it. I heard a lot of window dressing, a lot of slogans. We've sacrificed enough. And, um, you know, if the Liberal government doesn't uh, come through now, um, when will it ever? With the politics on the issue so deeply entrenched, the Liberals are also not choosing the complicated path of a national handgun ban, instead leaving that up to cities backed by federal penalties. But such a ban could be blocked by any province that doesn't want it. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. New video tonight shows a secret cry for help from a missing princess in Dubai. I'm a hostage and uh, this villa has been converted into a jail. Ahead on The National, the allegations against her father, one of the richest leaders in the world. Extreme winter weather south of the border leaves a path of destruction. Why this could be the new normal. And a pandemic pastime lands a Canadian in the Scrabble record books. I got 365 points for one word. The winning word, and it wasn't even that unusual. We're back in tune. Snow is about, about a foot on my car. From Ontario East, a harsh reminder today that this is indeed February in Canada. People in Ontario and Quebec were digging out and plowing through up to 30 centimeters of snow today. That made for some pretty dangerous roads. I'm a delivery person. I've gone sideways a couple of times. You've got to be very careful. And gave many students a snow day. Some on PEI got one too. There, it was the freezing rain that was the big problem, while New Brunswickers were hit with both snow and ice. Obviously, an unpleasant mix for most, but not everyone seemed to mind. So yes, it was disruptive in Canada, but across the United States, some more serious scenes. At least 16 deaths are now linked to wild winter storms that dumped snow on Texas, cut power to millions, and led several states to implement rolling blackouts. Katie Nicholson takes us through it all. It's frozen solid. Frozen cacti and frozen Texans. More than four million without power. The grid failed to keep up with the demand for electricity after plunging temperatures and a snowstorm walloped the Lone Star State. 
it all looks broken on the system. And so you can't tell what, is, what needs to be restored and repaired versus what's just rolling blackout. Mark Lindley has been without power for a full 24 hours. We've just been trying to make it through, stay warm and just stay in the house. That's all we can really do. Some haven't made it through. A mother and child died in this garage, seeking warmth from a running car. Overhead, thundersleet lit up the sky. A few states away, in North Carolina, a deadly tornado killed at least three people. Ten more injured, homes ripped apart. It truly, truly was a disaster last night. The deep south still in a deep freeze. While in Utah, an avalanche caught on camera washed over a mountain road where just moments ago this car had been. So many extremes in such a short time. Experts say get used to it. Effectively, what we're seeing is climate change in action. Climate change is effectively irreversible. It's here to stay. It has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen, period. There is no going backwards. He says the only thing to do now is better prepare for extreme weather, shoring up infrastructure like the roof of this Oregon grocery store, which collapsed under the weight of snow. Not far away, this site, a man pushing snow and ice from a floating home that lists into the water and floods. But for some in Washington state, all this snow, a happy reunion with a long lost friend. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Next, the doctors answer your great questions about kids and COVID-19. Is it too early to go back to school in Ontario? When will a vaccine be ready for kids? Plus, when COVID comes home, two children describe what it was like when they got sick. But first. I couldn't find anything at first, but then I saw the R. This is Betty Kukta of Chatham, Ontario, and apparently she is now something of an online Scrabble legend. Why? Well, that's because she got an incredible 365 points with one word, quizzers. So I put it down and it straddled two triple word scores, which means you get times nine. Okay, so we can probably skip the math because the point is Betty has just tied a North American record. Her 365 points for quizzers matches American Michael Cresta's 365 points for Quixotry, set back in 2006. Welcome back. When a child tests positive for COVID-19, it's a challenge for the whole family. Now, most kids develop mild symptoms, but as one Ontario family shows us, even between siblings, the virus's outcome can be very different. We hear all about the adults. We don't hear about the kids very often, and it can affect kids in so many different ways. I have one child who's a, a long hauler and the other one who barely had any symptoms. I'm Emily, I'm 13. I'm Melissa, I'm 10 years old. I swim with the Orange Water Swim Club. I like drawing, I like uh, playing my ukulele. I like to be outside and I'm a provincial level swimmer and we like to go skating. So I'm a first responder and I'm the one who brought it into our house. So we're assuming that I gave it to the kids um, just before I got symptoms. For me, I had a cough for two to three days and a stuffy nose for about 12 hours. That's all the symptoms I had. Because of Alyssa's asthma, she got all the respiratory stuff. I started getting a sore throat. Then it started like to be a kind of like bad head cold and like I had a bit of difficulty breathing. Alyssa was the sickest out of the family. Day eight, she broke out in hives and a rash, head to toe, and that was scary. On day nine, her hands, feet, and face swelled up. And she couldn't even walk into my room, she crawled in. I was like red all over, and it was like really bumpy. So they did lots of blood work, and fortunately, it wasn't in any of her organs. It is now a little over four months later and she's still experiencing a lot of joint pain, still some trouble breathing, and she's still getting all sorts of rashes and hives. It like sometimes just affects being a kid, cause like walking up the hill hurts my knees. Like 
skating sometimes hurts my knees. A few weeks after, I was back to training. I was back to like my old self. I was just worried that when me and Alyssa went back to school, people would just say behind her back, like, oh, there's the people that had COVID. But when I got back, they, they were all so happy to see me. Some of the boys were like, oh, I'm staying away from you, but like, I, that doesn't really bother me because boys can be annoying. But um, a lot of my friends were like, oh, hi, and like just welcoming back. I think we definitely treasure our time together at a little bit more now. If your child has any underlying conditions, be more vigilant. We were extremely careful and unfortunately COVID did come into our house. So we just heard from two kids who got sick from COVID-19. Some of those symptoms they describe sound pretty miserable. So what do we know now about how susceptible kids are to the coronavirus? How concerned should parents be? We are joined now by two pediatric infectious disease specialists, Dr. Jacqueline Wong and Dr. Fatima Kakar, to answer your questions. Thank you both for joining us. And Dr. Wong, let's start with you. In the first wave of the pandemic, we saw fewer cases of COVID-19 reported in kids compared to adults. Is that what we are still seeing now? Yes, fortunately, that's still the case. Um, it appears that children make up roughly 10 to 15 percent of cases, depending on the age cutoff that is used. So, for example, our national data indicated people 19 and under make up about 15 percent of cases. And then here in Ontario, people under the age of 20 made up about 13 percent of cases. And, and Dr. Kakar, at your hospital, what are you seeing in terms of kids? So to translate that into numbers, so at any given week, we have maybe anywhere from one to maximum four children hospitalized for COVID. And this is compared to the hundreds we actually have right now uh, among adults in Quebec. And what's also interesting is that half the time those kids aren't actually hospitalized for COVID. So uh, they might, they're all screened on admission, so they might come in for a fracture and appendicitis and we're finding COVID. So even if it's one to four kids, half of those aren't actually there for COVID. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's go to a video question now. It's from Derek Lofoon. He is asking what a lot of us are wondering about when it comes to kids. Have a listen. My question is, why are children more symptomatic than adults when it comes to COVID-19? So, Dr. Kakar, before you answer the why in Derek's question, is this the case? Are kids more asymptomatic? He is right. So kids are more asymptomatic. And even if they're symptomatic, they're mildly symptomatic. So it's very different from the symptoms that we're seeing in adults who have really severe lung disease. Um, and so the question of why we're learning more and more, but I think two things have stuck out now since we've, we've evolved. The first thing is that kids seem to have less of this receptor we call the ACE2 receptor, which the virus needs in order to get into your cells to do its damage. And then the other thing is that the response to the virus, so the inflammation is what's causing all of these symptoms in adults. And kids tend to have less of an inflammatory profile, so they're mounting less of a severe response. So that's why they're not getting the same level of symptoms as adults. Okay, it makes sense. So right now, as you both know, lots of people are worried about the risk of, of schools reopening. Uh, even kids are worried about that. So here's five-year-old Eliana. Is it too early to go back to school in Ontario? Okay, good question, Eliana. Dr. Wong, what are your thoughts? This is a very important question, and many of my patients have asked me the same thing. So similar to many countries around the world, in provinces where schools have remained open, they have not seen a spike in case counts as a result. So consistently, we are seeing that school reopenings do not contribute significantly to community transmission. When cases are identified in schools, they likely represent what's already going on in the community. So yes, I believe opening schools in Ontario can be done safely, especially when we follow public health principles like staying at home when sick, encouraging physical distance, saying practicing hand hygiene and wearing masks in proper situations. Okay, Dr. Uh, Kakar, sorry to interrupt you there. Um, okay. Lots of conversations are happening right now uh, about these variants of concern, um, the suggestions that these mutations are game changers when it comes to COVID. And I'm just curious, Dr. Kakar, what your sense is of whether they actually change the risk for kids? So with these new variants, the biggest concern is their transmissibility. 
So we know with a lot of these new variants, they're going to be more transmissible. So what's going to happen is if they do become the predominant strains, we're going to see more cases in the population, which means more cases in children. But the good news is that they don't seem to be more severe in children. So if we look, for example, at the UK that's had this new variant for months, yes, there are more cases in children, but they're not more severe. So they're not getting um, more hospitalizations or more adverse outcomes. So the, the game changer will that is that it might be more easily spread in places like schools and in workplaces, which means more cases, but not more severe cases. Okay. And in terms of, of vaccine timelines, especially for little ones, Again, another question, let's have a listen. My name is Sydney and I am nine years old. My question is, when will a vaccine be ready for kids? Right to the point there, Sydney, Dr. Wong. <laughs> Thanks for the great question. <laughs> so after you get a vaccine, the body makes antibodies and these are needed to fight the virus and protect you from getting COVID-19. So vaccine companies have already shown that this works in adults and that is why they're getting the vaccine first. Uh, the companies are now asking children 12 and older to participate in studies where they get the vaccine and then they get tested to see if they make the same number and type of antibodies as adults do. Um, it will take a number of months before these vaccines are finished, oh, sorry, these studies are finished and all the information is analyzed analyzed. And then for younger children like yourself, we might need different types of studies to inform us about what is the right number of doses to give you. Um, these companies also have to make sure that children who get the vaccine don't have too many side effects and are protected from COVID-19. So the bottom line is it's still going to be a number of months before it's your turn. Okay, fair. And, and I guess in the interim, uh, one last thought to you, Dr. Kakar. What can you offer to parents in terms of, of understanding what they can do to sort of help alleviate both the stress and the real physical concerns? So I think the, the first thing is I really want to reassure parents about COVID in children. So in a worst case scenario, even if your child gets COVID, and now we've had thousands and in my hospital we've had hundreds, the disease is really mild. And I know people are worried about their newborns and their infants and really the children are fine within 24, 48 hours. So the first thing is to not panic um, as much as if you're in a vulnerable group. The second thing is to know that all of the measures that people are taking, the hand washing, the distancing are really working well. We have virtually no other respiratory illnesses, no coughs, colds and flu circulating. So these measures work. It's just a matter of keeping them up, even though we're tired and, and, and people want this to be over. It's really continuing what they've been doing because these things have really worked well. Fantastic. Your patience, your insight, Dr. Wong, Dr. Kakar, thank you very much. Thank you. When we come back, demanding a better education. This is about students learning to think critically. This is about students learning to value the integrity of all of their peers. We speak with three Canadians determined to change our schools and fight anti-black racism. And the secret recordings of a missing princess begging for help. Why these videos are finally being made public. Welcome back. The Black Lives Matter movement has brought on calls for change in just about every area of our lives, including education. But advocates say the enduring pandemic has meant promises to address racism in schools have been put on hold. Deanna Sumanak Johnson spoke with three Canadians trying to do something about that. Charlene Grant is a mother of three and an advocate for black parents who feel their kids are unfairly treated in schools. And she says the pandemic has only made it worse. We're hearing children being suspended or get disciplined for not properly wearing their mask instead of just a, a, a teacher just reminding them to put their mask up or pull your mask up. Incidents like that are trying the patience of black parents who already distrusted the school system. Last year, rallies for equality within the education system accompanied the Black Lives Matter movement. The parents made demands and politicians made promises. Starting next year, we'll begin phasing out the practice of streaming for grade 9 students. But halfway into the school year, Grant says most other demands have been put on the back burner. Everything's about the second wave and what that would look like, the economy, but our other problem doesn't go away. Us being black and having those issues are still there. So some black educators are taking it upon themselves to initiate change. 
This Nova Scotia high school principal started an Afrocentric cohort of students where black history is integrated with other subjects, even math. So we're actually taking some of their own African Nova Scotian history and making sure that they understand the culture of that. We looked at factoring um, and within factoring, we looked at the world, looking at currency and how you take currency and doesn't matter where it is, you have to understand how it connects to what you're doing. In Toronto, D. Tyler Robinson helped create a high school course in anti-black racism, but it was only tried out in a single school. It's not just about anti-black racism. This is about students learning to think critically. This is about students learning to value the integrity of all of their peers. This is about building allyship. He too is trying to build allyships talking to his school board and the Ministry of Education to convince them to make the course available everywhere. Small steps towards making sure that, as the pandemic takes its toll on education, the ills of racism don't go unaddressed. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Next, the secret recordings of a missing princess in Dubai. Every day I am worried about my safety and my life. Why the videos are being made public tonight and the allegations against her father. Welcome back. Dubai's Princess Latifa hasn't been heard from in months, but new secret recordings acquired by the BBC's investigative series Panorama shows a princess in fear for her life. Renee Filipponi has the story of the missing royal who says her father is holding her captive. I'm, I'm a hostage and... Uh... This villa has been converted into a jail. All the windows. The videos shot on a secret cell phone and obtained by the BBC show a desperate princess. Every day I am worried about my safety and my life. Um, don't really know if I'm going to survive the situation. Princess Latifa, the daughter of the billionaire ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, has tried to escape her father's family twice. The second time in 2018 with the help of a friend. But they were caught on a boat in the Indian Ocean. Princess Latifa says she was forcibly returned to Dubai and put under house arrest. Those close to her say they lost contact months ago. We've taken the decision to release some of this evidence. We haven't taken this decision lightly. I feel that she would want us to fight for her and, and not give up. The Sheikh is one of the world's richest leaders and has powerful connections. In a UK custody ruling last year, the judge found the Sheikh had not only intimidated his former wife, Princess Haya, but there was evidence to prove he abducted Princess Latifa. World leaders now need to look at who they are calling friends and doing business with. The Sheikh has major investments in the UK and has been pictured with the Queen a number of times. Buckingham Palace has no comment, and some wonder what impact this news could have. Is it Britain getting involved to make Britain feel better? Or is it Britain getting involved because it actually might create uh, a change of heart and lead to the uh, freedom of this particular young woman? Now, you know, people have to be pretty candid about these things. Uh, it's not going to work. The Sheikh maintains he brought the princess back to Dubai on a rescue mission. The police threatened me that I'll be in prison my whole life and I'll never see the sun again. The UN says its working group on enforced disappearances is looking into the matter. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Next on the National, a CFL player pivots from football to puppies. The athlete who is rescuing animals from freezing temperatures. Brady Oliveira is best known as a running back for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, but lately the CFL Grey Cup winner has pursued another passion, rescuing puppies. Now many of the animals are in remote communities, often on the verge of freezing to death. Tonight his story behind a recent rescue is our moment. I've been volunteering with Canine Advocates Manitoba. I was on a rescue run um, about five hours away from Winnipeg. And uh, that day it was minus 51. Popped my head in the van and saw a dog in there. And she was extremely scared at first. Probably has never had human contact before. She wouldn't let me touch her, wouldn't let me pet her. Sat next to her for about five, 10 minutes. Life's gonna be a lot different for you now, hey? When I was able to finally pet her, she allowed me to pick her up and I brought her into a warm van. Just extremely passionate about 
you know, being a voice for the voiceless. It's amazing the the feeling that I get and the joy that I get and being able to bring them to a fresh start and to a new life and finally living the life that they get to deserve. So Brady tells us that he always works with the communities and always gets permission to go in there. He's, he figures that the canine rescue he's working with has has rescued around 2,000 dogs that tend to get fostered and then adopted. That is the National for February the 16th.